Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we're just getting the Zoom set up and figuring out how to get the, the room system, audio system to work and everything. So I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I did a test a few minutes ago and I think the audio should be working well. So um, drop in the chat if anybody can hear or, or you know, or one of us can speak a little louder, just, just let us know. Um, so thanks for joining us. Uh, so this online meetup is going to be about Container D. So why should container system platform builders care about Container D? And uh, with us today, we have Jessica Valorezo, who's a software engineer here at Docker. Uh, she's contributing to Container D, which is her first open source project. And prior to joining Docker, she was a student, student at Columbia. So without further ado, let's give it to Jessica. Hi everyone, thanks for joining. I'm Jessica. Um, Derek's also here. Um, he's on Container D2. Um, so yeah, uh, so let me walk through the agenda for today. Uh, I'm gonna be giving an introduction to Container D, going over top features and improvements um, with the 1.0 release, how you all can get started with Container D and the demo, and then how it's possible to contribute to Container D. So what is Container D? Um, Container D is the container daemon. It allows you to have uh, push and pull functionality. You also get image management. You get container lifecycle APIs, which allow you to create, manage, and execute containers. And then you also have snapshot management APIs. And I will run through a lot of this functionality today. So what were the technical goals with our 1.0 release. So one of our big goals was to have a clean gRPC-based API and client library. So we chose gRPC over REST because of the proto buff messages and the uh, full duplex streaming. We also have run runtime agility. Um, runtime agility meaning that Containerd is flexible across various platforms. We have full OCI support, OCI being the Open Container Initiative. This is the um, attempt at an open uh, industry standard for many container stuff. What this means is Container D is fully compatible with um, the OCI image spec and the OCI runtime spec. We also have stability and performance with the tight, well-defined core of container function. We have decoupled systems, including image, file system, and runtime. This is compared to the um, container systems of the past that are monolithic and tightly coupled. Container D is a la carte, so you can use what is what your what your plat like specific to what your platform needs are. Um, yeah. So what's the architecture here? So at the, at the bottom level, we have the operating system and let's see how Container D interfaces with that. So at the topmost level, we have the gRPC API and the metrics API. So the clients will be interacting with these APIs or um, your, your project. We have storage, which includes content, snapshot, and diff. We have metadata, which includes images and containers. And then we have tasks, which are what interfaces with, or interacts with the runtime. Um, runtimes can be swappable. And then we have events, and this is across all the services. So when we look at this, we can, we, if you see my arrow, this is container D here. Cool. Um, and I'm going to talk about these services a bit more in depth as we go on. Something that one of the goals of Containerd was also to have a, a very robust client that you can integrate into your platform. It's currently integrated in Mobi and Cry Container D. Um, this allows us to to keep the services from Containerd from getting too bloated. For example, 
with the clients we have image pull and push that actually um, consists of many various api calls to various services in container d but we we pull that out of container d into the client and as you can see here container d is what's um, managing and executing the containers um, and interacting with the runtimes that are in your in your platform um, and these are swappable i'm going to just speak a bit to the oci image spec which we have in front of us we have um here on the left we have our manifest list the image spec is essentially like how we view an image so we have the manifest list and the manifest list is referenced by a digest and within that manifest list we have a list of manifests um, and these have a list of digests that represent various platform specific manifests so for me i would um, use the Linux AMD 64 manifest. And so in an image pool, we, we use that digest to get the manifest itself. And in the manifest itself, we have the image config. The image config has just the general information about the image and also has um, runtime and execution parameters such as uh, networks and volumes. Um, and then we also have a list of layers here, a list of layer digests, and those reference various layers. And so the layers that we, the layers are essentially how you can think of, like if you think of a Docker build, um, that, that equates to one layer. So yeah, we have this tree here almost of digest references. Something that's pretty cool about Container D, in my opinion, is um, content addressability. And this was a new concept to me, so I, I'm going to walk us through um, my idea of it. So here we here we have foo, which is content, um, and from that content we have um, a digest or the reference to that content. And I would represent that like this. So we have foo, and then we have this reference here. What we can do is we can wrap that digest and generate another digest, but, but we added new content, so we have bar. And so that's how this maps out. So we have this uh, SHA 2E948, um, and that references bar, but also foo. And the reason why uh, this is really helpful is it, it also allows us to check whether or not content has been tampered with. So if we modify the content, the digest will actually change. And so this, it, this bubbles up the tree essentially and will modify the topmost level digest as well. And so just to summarize, everything in the content store essentially which includes like manifest manifest list layers is all content addressable um, and this allows us to not only reference various content but to make sure it's secure so i'm just going to walk back really quickly because i want <laughs> this just to like show so like if we if we modify something here um at this layer then this digest will change so essentially what needs to be securely transported or when we pull from a remote registry this is the digest that needs to be um, secured so i'm going to jump forward again okay so what, where does container d come into place so we have this image spec and we can take the image config and we use the image config plus some other defaults and like platform specific information um, from C groups to security profiles and Containerd will convert that into the OCI runtime spec. Uh, a quick introduction to what the runtime spec is, it allows you to have the look and feel of your own operating system. So this is what this is essentially what makes you feel like you're in a container. 
And then we take the layers here and we use ContainerD to convert them to the root file system. Both, of, both the OCI runtime spec and the root file system wrapped together um, are the two pieces that are needed to actually run a container. So ContainerD will take care of um, essentially like converting these for you. So how do you build a container root file system? We use snapshotters. So I, I'd just like to summarize a bit more of our storage architecture. So we have the metadata store, which includes the containers and the image store um, that I referenced in our first architecture slide. We can think of the metadata store as just quick writes to disk because we, we just keep that as small as possible. The content store has these the content ad addressable blobs that we pulled. So that would be the manifest list, the manifest, the layers, the image config. And we also have our snapshotter. And so use a combination of all of this is how we um, generate the runtime spec in our root file system. So something that's pretty exciting about the snapshotter interface is that it is a lot smaller and more focused than uh, the graph driver interface that was being used in Docker. Um, so essentially the snapshotter interface is how we manage the life cycle of the snapshots. So specifically uh, when we use prepare, when we use commit, when we use remove, we're managing that life cycle. Uh, the keys are um, up to the users, what the user wants. Um, that's also something that's different from the graph driver interface. Another thing that's different is we have mounts. Um, we don't do actual mounting via the snapshotter interface, but we, we can generate the mounts given uh, a key. And so, yeah, I, I'll walk through uh, the snapshot model here. So some things to note about this diagram are when we're in a committed state, we're in read only. And when we're in an active state, we're in read write. And so essentially the process goes is you have a committed snapshot and then you prepare it. And in this process of preparing it, you have a read write state where you have essentially like a, uh, a workspace. And so uh, an analogy could be GitHub where you, when something's committed, you, you can't modify it at that time. But if you check out a branch and you have like an active workspace, you um, can modify the files. And so when we have A here, the difference between A and A prime is, for example, when you modify add or remove files, you have this diff here. And so you can go back and commit it again. And in committing it, you make it read only. But P1, one thing that we have with the snapshot models, we have a history. And so essentially P1 is the child of P0. And so we can track essentially how these snapshots are related. And we, this last prepare and commit. So when we prepare, given our key B, um, and we commit it again, even though we didn't change any files, we still have a different snapshot because it has a different parent. But if you were to mount P1 and P2, you would essentially see the same file system. Uh, you can also remove. And so essentially, with so layers in the content store themselves are pretty useless because they're just in a raw image format. Um, layers go through a process of um, committing, becoming active, um, uh, being unpacked and um, added on top of one another, and one another so that we have a final snapshot which can later be used to run a container. Um, and so the snapshot gives us a, like a disk representation of that root file system. So 
So I'm going to walk us through how we can pull an image. So a pull from the client perspective is just this pull call, but for container D content images and snapshot services, um, we have various calls. So we have a fetch, which pulls our content from the remote registry. And it puts the manifest, manifest list, layers, all that into the content store. It also saves a reference um, and digest an image name in the image metadata store. And then we go through unpacking that image, which pulls the content from the content service. It, and then it unpacks the layers one on top of another, as I previously mentioned. And from the snapshot service, that's how we can generate those mounts later on. Okay, so I, I was just gonna show a bit of how um, this looks like in, what this looks like in container D. Let's make it as big as possible. Okay, so just for some context, um, container D is, I'm on a, on a Mac and so I'm running container D in, inside a, a Linux machine. So let me just get container D up and running. Okay, cool. So I have the daemon started there. And so I'm gonna use CTR. So CTR is the, uh, just a test tool that integrates the container D client. And so this binary, it, it, we call it the container D CLI, and we have all these commands that are available to us, which allow you to interact with the services. And um, yeah, so I am going to run through a uh, container D pool, like an image pool, and um, see what we have in our content store and our uh, snapshots, like saved in our snapshots. So, make it, I feel like this isn't very good. Just want to make sure everyone can see it. <laughs> okay. Um, I prepend it with docker.io because container D doesn't assume that Docker is the remote registry. So here we can see everything, like a list of everything that we pull, pulled into our content store. And so I can verify that we have this by just seeing a list here. It's not the cutest right now, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can see it's all there. Um, and I'm going to just decompose what this image looks like because I think this is pretty cool. Um, so I, I look, I'm going to look at the, the content of the index, which was the manifest list. So cool. So I just got the manifest list. So it's like we saw in the diagram, we have this media type, which is states that it's a manifest list, and then we have all these manifests um, that are specific to our platform. So if I want, so I, since I'm on a Linux AMD64, I can look at this digest and see what I get. And remember that the content store is content adjustable. So this is literally how I get my manifest. And so we can see the manifest has our image config and our layers. And I'm going to look at what's inside this image config. And I'm just going to pipe it to make it prettier. So this is our image config. I'm just going to scroll to the top here. 
Yeah, so you can see here we have environment variables, we have the volume, we have our entry point. Yeah, we have some, some commands to run. So yeah, and that's what will later be converted to the, the runtime spec. And then I, I can look at one of our layers and just um, decompress it for us. Let me just, just grab a random, this might be a huge file, but <laughs> we'll see. Um, so I went back and I just got one of the layer digests from our list that we had from the initial image pool. Um, oh yeah, so this is a big one, but as you can see here, we have a bunch of directories that are super familiar. We have like temp, we have, we have bin, user bin, user local bin. So that's pretty cool. We can see this Redis server here. Notice that if I list our images, we don't have, we have just our, our reference and then the digest and that's it. Another cool thing is we can see our snapshots. Um, you can see that they're committed right now. Another really cool thing about the snapshots is you can see the tree. And so remember how the snapshot model had us going through um, the, the life cycle of the snapshot. We can see that history right here. So yeah, um, and I will do running a container after I go, go through a couple slides for that. Um, cool. Okay, so tasks and runtime. I think tasks and runtime are pretty cool in ContainerD because they have separated out the functionality of a container to be a container metadata object um, and a task object. So. In Docker, the container had both the resources and the state all packed together in one object, but here we've separated them out. In the container service, that's where we keep track of metadata um, for the container, including um, the runtime spec. We have the um, like the the image. We have the snapshotter. We have the snapshot key or like the root file system name. All of these resources are what's needed to eventually run the container, but we just pack them into this metadata object. Um, we show the API client here and the runtime spec because ContainerD itself doesn't care about the runtime spec. It just takes the runtime spec and passes it through the container service and that makes its way eventually to the runtime. We have the task service, which is the runnable object in container D. It's what, when you start a container, that the task object is what's actually starting, a pro creating a process and starting it. It is what actually interacts with the runtime itself. And the tasks, service, we, we, the client is in charge of grabbing the mounts from the snapshot service and then passing those mounts to the task service and the task service just passes them through directly to the runtime. And so, yeah, we have this little separation of metadata and state. That is start a container. So we have a run command that I'll show in CTR, but it actually, consists of many calls. We First, we prepare our snapshot. Uh, preparing the snapshot, meaning that we put it into a read-write state that um, is the 
root file system that we'll use to start the start a new task. We we have that we have that. If you remember that the interface, um, you provided a key, so that's a key that we'll we're essentially tying the snapshot to. We also have the image config that we're converting to the runtime specification. So in our create step, we create that container metadata object and we tie all of these references um, in one in one container object. Um, and then we start the container. And so starting the container actually consists of creating and starting a task. Um, we pull, we use a snapshot service to get the mounts um, that are referenced in the container object. And yeah, the task, task is ready to go and now we're running containers. So, okay, I'm going to run through what this looks like here. Um, So, okay. not running out, Brian. <laughs> cool. So, oh, I'm not doing this correctly. Um, so we have this run command in uh, CTR and we provide it the image, and then we also need to provide it a container ID, um, as you see. So I'll just call it test. So this starts our, our server. So not only did this create the container object, but it started, created and started the task. I'm gonna just show you in CTR how you can get information about um, both the container and the task. So we can see a list of, I wish this was created correctly. We can see that we have this container called test, and this is the image associated with it, and our runtime. Um, we can see the info about our container, so the ID, image, runtime. The spec is currently encoded, um, but it's cool to see that the snapshot key is named as test, and this is a snapshot that's associated with it. We can see that snapshot in our tree now, like this. And then if we look at a list of our snapshots, we can see that it's active, which is pretty dope. Um, and then let me just, we can also see what's up with the tasks. So we can see that we have this task named test, we have this PID associated to it, and its status or state is running. I'll just show what are some other things that we can do with the task command. You can, you can kill, you can pause, you can resume, you can start this task and so I'm going to just kill it. And as you see over here, it stopped running. And it's no longer in our list here, but we still have our container and we can still And then we can actually start that task again. Uh, another cool, how much time do I have? Okay, okay, cool. I, I wanted to run through another kind of cool thing that you can do with CTR. Um, so I'm gonna pull another image. Oh, 
example. Um, and then I can see it in our tree here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run a container with Alpine. I'm going to give us a console. <laughs> cool. So I'm in here, and then I have a little, I have a little, little script here that I can run. <laughs> what I wanted. So I'm going to essentially just echo foo into a file called file indefinitely. And so what I can do here is I can I'm going to create a little uh, directory and I can use my mounts command, I can pass it um, my target and then, oh shoot, it's going to be called sh <laughs> because I forgot to give, um, I passed the last command that I gave is the container ID, so I accidentally forgot to say like test two, so here we are. Um, <laughs> and so I'm going to pipe this. Cool. So <laughs> the, I just would like to show the out. So um, the mount command gets essentially the mount commands that you need for the snapshot. So what's really cool is I can um, see what I have in my Here, and you can see I have this file now that I generated in my container and I can see oh, nope I need to count the file itself um, cool so I can see the file that I created in my container and I've mounted it in my own post oh that's it the file Data. Oh, wait. Yeah, so it's, you can see it's, it's in real time. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, let's get back to this. So, okay. Um, so we, we have CTR, right? And I wanted to show how we do this via the client because that's how many, if you're looking to use ContainerD um, client in your code itself, um, it's nice to have a little reference. So we had, we pulled Redis Alpine, we have that image. Um, it's pretty cool. We, a concept that I didn't go over, but is useful to know is you can we have namespaces and that's what you see here we export containerd namespace equals example uh, namespaces essentially allow for multiple consumers to use the same containerd without conflicting um, so you can share content but you have separation um, for containers and images and so this code here um, on the right, we connect to our containerd daemon. That was the command that I started off. Um, it was on the right side of my terminal screen, like that daemon running. So that's how we connect. Um, we can set our namespaces to your example. And this is how the client pool looks. Cool. And so we have this, it returns to us our image metadata object. 
to run the container itself, we, we first have to create a new container. So we specify the name, Redis server, for example, we create the new snapshot. So we say, okay, we're gonna call our snapshot Redis readfs and we hand it the image. This essentially will, as you can see, it allocates a new read write root file system based on the image. And then we also specify a new spec. And here we use the image config. Yeah, and so it's pretty straightforward. <laughs> we can create a new task from the container and then we can interact with that task. So here I'm calling wait on the task and then I call start on the task. And it's, it, this is what actually starts the, the process in the container. And so this is all hidden behind the run command, but as we later saw using, um, doing CTR container LS and CTR task LS, what that looks like. And then we can kill a task too in our client code. Um, I just, this is just, we're sleeping it, sleeping our system for a bit. And then, yeah, you can kill, you can specify the, the kill, it, like call that you want. So we chose sick term here. And then you can output the exit code. So yeah, this is more just, this is very similar to our getting started. So yeah, cool. Oop, that was an old slide. <laughs> okay, so we have our uh, metrics API, which is pretty dope. You can see all the container level metrics. You can hit um, V1 slash metrics and it will compile, it'll just like grab all the information that it has available there. Um, so yeah, that's pretty helpful. I wanted to go over our su supported components. So as of right now, gRPC and metrics is stable. It's in its 1.0. Our Go client is unstable, but we're tentatively hoping to have it stabilized in 1.1. And the CTR tool is unstable in its F scope. Our su support horizon is are essentially everything other than 1.0 is now <laughs> at its end of life and 1.0 will be active and it's end of life we just released on december 5th and it's in as you see the end of life is either the max between one year from now or the release of 1.1 and then 1.1 is what we have coming up next so yeah, this is what our release looked like. It was pretty exciting. Um, we had a bunch of really cool stuff in it. Um, and I'm gonna go over some of our cool improvements. So we have stress testing. Um, this allows you to um, test, again, like test, you can essentially um, choose a time period and a, a level of concurrency and we can see how, how many containers are created, started, and deleted in that time. This is really good if you're adding in any big changes. Another really cool, <laughs> another really cool feature was garbage collection. Essentially, garbage collection, you on an image delete and a, on a container delete, um, we can specify the uh, the garbage collector will will. This, process, this background process will go through and mark, uses a mark and sweep method to see um, which references in content and metadata and snapshots are no longer needed and marks them as dirty. And then in the next garbage collection, it will actually pick up all of those unneeded resources. This, the garbage collector is configurable. Um, the default configuration is 20 milliseconds per second for the max amount of time for the metadata store to be um, locked. So this is all configurable and yeah, super helpful. Another cool thing is we had container D shim reduction. 
So per container, we generate one shin. And so in order to have a higher density in the number of containers that you can run, we reduce the um, shim pretty significantly. So some use cases for container D. Um, it's currently in Docker, Kubernetes with Cry Container D, Linux Kit and Build Kit, and it has a lot of potential. Um, IBM Cloud, OpenFAS, and Deer Project. So how can you go further with Container D? Uh, we would love, love, love to see uh, bug reports, bug fixes, tests, improved docs validation. Every contribution is so welcome. You can get started with Container D. You can see in our docs folder, we have this pretty great getting started guide. Um, we would appreciate porting and testing across other architectures and operating systems. Try out our stress test tool. Um, yeah, we have the documentation in, in our repo and yeah, and we, uh, Kubernetes Cry is also, it's an incubation project that uses Container D as the runtime. Um, it's in beta today, so take a look at that too. Cool, thanks. So, maybe we can open up to questions. Yeah, so there's some questions in the chat. Derek's also been answering a few of them. Yeah, I was just going to answer great. them. I just Answer that here. Yeah, I would just um just re reiterate the question and then you can go ahead and answer. Uh, sure. I don't know. The question. I don't know if I can be heard at all. Yeah. Share. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. You can keep the share if you want to. Oh, and then okay, I'm sure. We can. <laughs> well, let me just go through some of the questions. So, so the first question was around. Uh, uh, oh, yeah, I answered one of them, which was about whether or not CTR needs to be run as root. Um, by default, yes, CTR needs to be run as root. Uh, the socket that Containerd opens up that CTR talks to is is going to be root protected, and it's it's important that this this uh, socket is protected because I mean you can run any sort of container with any sort of like C group configuration you want, so it's as good as like running uh, running something as root. Um, you can uh, kind of give a group uh, or give a different group other than root, or kind of widen the privileges if you want, uh, like if you're on a local machine, um, that, that's fine to do. That's uh, all configurable within container D. <clears throat> the second question is uh, some confusion about kind of what's the role of container D with uh, Docker and run C. Uh, so if you're using Docker today, you're actually using uh, both container D and run C underneath it. So think of Docker as kind of the higher level API. So if you have the, the, the Docker uh, CLI, you're actually using the, the Docker API to, to talk to the Docker daemon. Uh, the Docker daemon is talking to container D. Um, container D is supervising the containers um, and it's calling out to run C. Run C is just a, a small script that, or it's, it's it has a small uh, lifespan. You, you execute run C, run C does something, and then run C goes away. Uh, container D stays around um, to kind of manage the containers that are being run. Um, and then Docker on top of that is uh, basically doing everything that you'd expect to be able to do with the Docker API. It's handling networking, it's handling volumes. Uh, today it's still handling uh, graph drivers. Uh, so it's, it's responsible for starting up containers and or determining what containers should be running, starting them up, um, and all that. Um, uh, if you want clarification, just just drop that into chat. Um, there was an, there was another question about along that line related to where was that about Rocket? How would you compare with with Docker and Rocket? Um, so. I don't know specifically about like what the what some of the differences in terms of of the scope with Rocket is. I mean, the Rocket kind of has a, a slightly different model, um, but generally you could you could use Rocket to to run run C containers as well. Um, I'm not sure how it in terms of it's, it's daemonized. Um, uh, let me let me answer the other question. 
what about container D and orchestration? Um, so that's, 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 that's a good question. We didn't cover uh, another project that's uh, called CRI container D, uh, which is uh, it's the container runtime interface implementation for Kubernetes uh, that basically it, it implements uh, this interface for Kubernetes so that container D can act as a backend uh, to use within Kubernetes itself. Um, this is a, a, a separate project right now um, being run as a Kubernetes incubator. Um, but basically that uh, CRI container D is responsible for uh, handling the commands directly from Kubernetes, starting containers, handling networking, volumes, everything uh, within Kubernetes. So container D itself doesn't do any orchestration. And then um, Docker as well, the Docker Swarm um, is also going to be responsible for just calling out the container D for starting containers. <coughs> um, is there any other questions that are, that are asked? Or is there any clarification that people want in some of those? Is there... I, was just kind of, I was just kind of going through them really quickly. Is the CTR command going to replace the Docker command? Yeah. Oh, where did you see that? It, was, it just came out. Um, no, so think of CTR right now as it's kind of a debug tool uh, for uh, using container D from um, like you want to, if, if you want to drive container D today, normally the way it, uh, the end user is going to drive it is they're going to be using Kubernetes or they're going to be using Docker. They're not going to be using container D directly. Um, if you're trying to integrate um, some other project within or if, if you're trying to use container D for your own kind of orchestration or container system, um, then you'll find CTR really helpful for, uh, for kind of debugging and, and, and driving container D. Um, or if you just like playing around with kind of, uh, kind of one layer below Docker, uh, then you might find kind of CTR fun to play with. But um, I think generally end users who are running containers are, are just gonna be using Docker or uh, the cube cuddle. <laughs> Stephen uh, Stephen said, point out that container D is meant to be used locally. Uh, yeah, I mean, <laughs> Con container D is kind of meant to run on on the single the single node. There's there's no like there's nothing like in Docker Swarm today where there's uh, it, there's anything configuring the container Ds to kind of act as a single container D or talk to container D across hosts. Um, we open container D on a local socket, and we have no plans of kind of exposing the container D over the network. <laughs> yes, the, the slides and the video recording will be, will be posted hopefully later today, if not um, tomorrow. Where are all these questions at? Is there, I don't think, was there anything else? I don't, I, I think they, I think Derek and Jess answered pretty much all the questions, but if um, anybody who dropped something in the chat uh, or the Q&A, if, if we missed something, uh, please uh, drop it in there again. Um, otherwise, We'll kind of finish up here. Okay, I don't, I don't see any other questions. Um, but you have uh, Jess's contact information too. If you kind of think of anything else you'd like to 